So good morning to everyone. I'm pleased uh, to also welcome you to COMPSA. I'm very pleased uh, to introduce uh, the first keynote speaker of uh, COMPSA. Uh, Dr. Larry Smart became the founding director in 2000 of the California Institute of Technology and, Info and uh, Telecommunication, known as CALIT2, which is a joint uh, uh, initiative by UC San Diego and UC Irvine. And he also holds the Harry Gruber professorships in computer sciences and engineering at UC San Diego. Uh, before that, uh, Larry worked uh, for 15 years, uh, and he was uh, the founding uh, director of the National Computer Supercomputing Application Center. And uh, also, he has um, served our community in many different ways. Some notable achievement and service have been uh, to be part of the uh, PTAC, which is the Presidential Information Technology Advisory Committee for uh, President Clinton. Larry is also a member of the National Academy of Engineering, as well as a fellow of the American Physical Society and the um, uh, Artificial Intelligence Society. Also, he received the, CANI, the IEEE Computer Society CANI Award in 2006 for his research on distributed system. Last, I would like to mention that he has really contributed uh, to many important uh, um, technology. So he has been uh, doing uh, important research in the area of uh, grid computing, web distributed system. But today he will uh, present a very important topic which is really important for our, for our society. Uh, so I believe uh, that at the end of his talk, you will uh, walk out from the session with many interesting research ideas for future work. Okay, so let me, uh, you know, help me welcoming uh, Larry. Well, I'm pleased to be here. Um, in addition to computer science, I've actually worked for uh, a number of decades with your sciences committee and community, including uh, NASA uh, and the National Research Council. And that's been useful background for where we're going today. You've all heard uh, about the problems we've got with climate change, but I, I suspect that most of you don't actually follow the latest scientific papers uh, on uh, the global climate disruption that we're entering into um, and haven't thought that much about the role our community and information communication technologies has uh, relative to this crisis. And so I've been trying to pull together uh, sort of a tutorial, if you like, on what the problem is and how our community can be a major help in um, and slowing down the rate of emissions. As you'll see, basically, today the amount of greenhouse gas that has been emitted in the atmosphere already is going to endanger the world as we know it. And yet, there is so much more greenhouse gas emission that is going to be coming in the next several decades that will make this situation even worse. So anything we can do to lower the rates of emission into the atmosphere of carbon dioxide or the other greenhouse gases is going to make an important contribution. And so there's a major new study called SMART 2020, Enabling the Low Carbon Economy in the Information Age, that the Climate Group put together, which has a lot of the uh, companies that are in the IT and telecom sector. And what they point out is that using not only um, cleaning up our own act, uh, actually making our, our systems more energy efficient, but the application of those systems can uh, reduce as much as 15 percent the uh, emissions. And you'll see that uh, every bit we can reduce is going to be important. So I'm going to start, first of all, with stuff that you probably don't normally see, which has to do with the earth sciences. Um, this is uh, just to give you a sense of how urgent the problem really is. This is a probability distribution of the warming that we can expect from the CO2 and other greenhouse gases that are already in the atmosphere that have been emitted 
since the start of the Industrial Age 200 years ago. Uh, and you can see that roughly speaking, there is about the most likely amount of warming we'll get is about, oh, say, two and a half degrees centigrade. However, so far, all we've seen, all the, wor all the stuff you've heard about melting this and melting that, comes from just about a, a 0 0.8 degrees C. So only about a third of what is going to get, is going to happen in terms of the warming up from the CO2 that's in the air now has happened. Um, and that's because the oceans take about 50 years to change their equilibrium uh, and because a lot of the aerosols that are being emitted, particularly in um, Asia, uh, are cooling the earth. And so as the air, air gets cleaned up, as the air pollution is cleaned up, the uh, rest of that warming will appear. Now scientists, there are thousands of scientists around the world that work on this problem. Uh, and they've got a consensus of where, at different temperatures, things begin to tip. So the summer Arctic ice, the Himalayan glaciers, the Greenland ice sheet, and so on. And you can see that several, if this is right, several, we're already committed to some pretty spectacular changes in the Earth. But as we add more CO2, the peak of this curve moves further this way and to greater climate disruption. And as I say, we've only seen about a third of what we're already committed to, with, even if we didn't admit any more. So let me give you an example. This is from NASA. This is the Arctic. And the ice in the Arctic uh, is of different ages. And the darkest red here is the ice that's several years old. And you can see that in the 1980s to, to, to 2000, uh, there was a lot of, of that uh, older ice here. But in the latest, uh, 2009, this year, very, very little of that exists. And if you look here at the two-year-old versus year from 1981 up until today, you can see why the climate scientists say that in just a few years it could go to zero. Namely, uh, the Arctic will become effectively ice-free perhaps as early as five, uh, four years from now, which will have dramatic changes in climate uh, all over the northern hemisphere. We just held a conference uh, with our colleagues uh, from Asia uh, on the third largest amount of snow and ice in the world outside of the North and South Pole, which is in the Himalaya uh, uplift. Uh, and all of the great rivers from the Indus to the Ganges to the Yangtze to the Mekong are the way that as that snow and ice melts, it goes to the ocean. These are the so-called water towers of Asia. Well, the ice is very rapidly melting because at high elevations, as well as at high latitudes, you get a multiple of the average uh, warming. So in other words, they go much faster than the average. And this, of course, impacts uh, the water supply for billions of, of people. Now. You know, people say, well, this is just a natural oscillation. You know, climate does this. Well, that's true. Um, here is the last 800,000 years, which you can get from ice cores in Antarctica. And what you can see here is if you look at the carbon dioxide in parts per million, here we are today. And then you go back into the bottom of the ice age, where there was, say, a mile of ice on top of where we now have Chicago. And then it warmed up as you go back in time to 120,000 years ago was another warm period, then a cold period, then a warm period, and then a cold period. So that does oscillate back and forth. But you'll notice that the parts per million of, of CO2 in the atmosphere, that is the amount of CO2 in the, by volume in the atmosphere, oscillates between about 170 parts per million and about 300, and has done so for 800,000 years. That is, it hasn't gotten above 300 parts per, per million. Well, let's look in detail at the last um, uh, ice age where we went from, this is uh, 10,000 years ago to about 20,000 years ago. So here you are at the depth of the ice age, you know, ice all over the United Kingdom and Northern Europe and all over the US. And then it started warming up until it got to about 10,000 years ago to where it is now. Notice that the parts per million, again, go from about 180 up to about 270. Well, what was the rate? 
it went at about 80 parts per million in about 6,000 years. In other words, from here, uh, about 17,000 years ago to about uh, 11,000 years. So that's 6,000 years, and you can see it's more or less an even rise in temperature, uh, or in CO2, and also up here is in temperature. And um, that's about 1.33 parts per million per century. Well, here's the famous curve on the, taken from the top of Mauna Loa, the so-called Keeling curve, where we've been measuring very carefully the CO2 in the atmosphere from 1960 up until now. And you can see it's gone from 310 up to th 386. Um, so in particular, if we fit a curve to that again, it's gone up about 50 parts per million, not much different than what happened during the last ice age warming. But it did it in 20 years, not 6,000. And it's going up at 2.5 parts per million per year which means it's 200 times faster. We're warming at a rate 200 times faster than nature on its own does. And what that means is the Earth's climate is very much out of equilibrium, dramatically out of equilibrium in a very unnatural way. Now, the problem is that we're going to continue to add CO2. China and India in particular are ramping up their economies. China, 80% of the electricity in China comes from burning coal, which directly adds CO2 to the atmosphere. And so you can see, this is an estimate from uh, Shell uh, Oil, which does scenarios. This is, a very, um, this is a very optimistic scenario. In other words, they've done everything, I think, way beyond what we saw from the G8 meeting recently, the leaders of the, of the eight industrial countries. Uh, you saw basically a bunch of bickering. Um, you know, the Chinese and the Indians said, we're not going to be slowing down our economies just because uh, you want us to. Uh, so we're still at the bickering stage, you know. We're not at the committed action stage yet. And so even if something as optimistic as this happens, the estimated CO2 will be 550 parts per million. Well. Scientists have recently, this is a paper that just came out in June of this year, so this is last month in science, and they've been able, here's the ice cores that you saw before, back to 800,000 years, but using plankton, you can now take it back over 2 million years. And you can see, again, the oscillation in our atmosphere was about, from about 180 to about 300. Here we are today, and here's where we will be by 2100 if, if the shell projection is correct. So we are going to be way, way, way away from anything that this Earth has known for the last two million years. I'll remind you, two million years ago, Australopithecus was the most advanced species of human on Earth. You know, Homo erectus was just coming up. Homo sapiens was a, a long way in the future. So as far as, as all of our species and its ancestries has been concerned, we are in a state of climate that is dramatically different. Now, what's even worse is Susan Solomon, who's one of the top uh, atmospheric scientists, just did this calculation, came out earlier this year. And depending, going back, here's 1800, 2000, here's 2200, here's the year 3000, 1000 years in the future. And if this is the CO2 rise, what you just saw, going up to, you know, say 550 we talked about, CO2 takes a very long time to get out of the atmosphere. And so here's the warming. And so basically, a thousand years from now, the temperature will be basically more or less what we drive it up to in the next few decades. So what we do in the next few decades will determine the state of this planet's climate for the next thousand years. That's a serious problem. Okay. So as Tom Friedman's book, if you want to learn more about this, particularly the international dimensions of it, I really recommend this book to you. But he concludes it'll be the, trying to deal with this will be the biggest peacetime project that humans have ever undertaken. So think of like World War II, but peaceful. That's the kind of scale of, of action that's going to be required. So what can we do about it in our field? Well, there's this great book, uh, 
of study that I urge you to download. It's www.smart2020.org. You can see you know many of the companies over here who have contributed to this study. And essentially, all these companies are saying, OK, we've got to get serious about this. Let's try to figure out uh, what is going to be happening over, say, just the next 10 years. Well, here's I'm going to share with you some of the results. This is the amount of CO2 in billions of tons that are emitted as a CO2 equivalent. So I'm not getting into the details. This also includes methane and, and nitrous oxides and the other greenhouse gases. But let's just call them you know, CO2 equivalents. This includes, by the way, the life cycle in the dark green, which is uh, the digging the gold wire, you know, the gold out of the ground to make the gold wire that goes into the circuits and so forth. I mean, taking all of the energy that's associated with making our equipment and then disposing of our equipment. And then the yellow is the electricity, the CO2 that comes from generating the electricity. We need to run our computers, cool our computers, and so forth, right? Well, you can see in 2007, we're up at about 2% of the total emissions on the planet come from our industry. That's about the same as the aviation industry. Now, when you see a jet plane up in the air spewing exhaust into the atmosphere, you think, OK, that's adding CO2 to the atmosphere and nitrous oxides and so forth. When we're running our computers, we don't think we're doing it. But of course, the power plant that's making the electricity is certainly, if it's a coal power plant or natural gas power plant, adding those emissions into the air. Now look what happens by just 10 years from now, by 2020. And by the way, all of the things that you hear at green IT conferences or power management conferences about ideas for helping have been taken into account in this estimate. So this is a, this is a very conservative estimate. If we don't do a lot of the things I'll tell you about, over the next five to 10 years, this bar would be much longer. Okay? Um, and as we'll, we'll see, most of this is actually in developing countries. So let's look at it. One of the problems is that people in the United States tend to have a very xenophobic view. So they think that the United States is like everything. And so all we have to do is clean our act up and everything will be fine. It turns out, if you look at the bar, this is by countries. These are the same length bars you just saw, that is the emissions in, from 2002 to 2020. Here in the dark green is the United States and Canada. So in 2020, the emissions that are all of our telecom infrastructure, our mobile infrastructure, telephone, our, our wired infrastructure, our computers, our storage, our data centers, all of this, 14% of those emissions will be due to the United States and Canada. Just China alone will be nearly 30%. Okay? And then this is India and the rest of the world over here. So um, you know, this problem is only going to get solved outside of the United States. We have to do our part. But in terms of the actual magnitude of the threat, uh, it has to be a global solution. Now, let's break it down into what parts of this make uh, are involved in, in the sort of fields you work in. So these, again, the same bars. But now I've broken down. This is, these are the emissions just to run PCs, peripherals, and printers. So this is all of the stuff at the edge of the net. This is the data centers. And then this is the telecom infrastructure itself and things like cell phones and so forth. I find this really astonishing. What it means is most of the work, and the work I'll talk about with Project Greenlight, is focused on the data centers. And we think, well, gee, Google you know, has hundreds of thousands of processors and, and Microsoft and, and Yahoo. That must be the problem, you know, all of the corporation's data centers. Well, think about it. By 2020, there will be 4 billion PCs. How many servers are there? I mean, even if Google has a million servers, that's one in 4,000 <laughs> of the number of, of, of processors. They're just processors, right? They each give off heat. So it's the vast number of people that have PCs that are dominating this problem. 
So we got to think, that how can we clean up our PCs? But we're also, of course, data centers. Everything has to be thought of to make this better. So let me start. I'm going to start with talking about laptops. And this will deal with a lot of the kinds of software issues that, that you work on, both in the laptops. And then I'm going to do data centers. OK. Well, what about a laptop? The thing is, you can't do this just component by component. You've got to think of this at a system architecture level and an integration of the hardware architecture with the software architecture and, by the way, with the applications themselves. So you have to coordinate across the processing, communications, and networking. In other words, if you take a modern uh, device, whether you know it's a PC like you're using or a BlackBerry or, or a Pre, uh, you know, some of you have iPhones. Anyway, it's a very complicated hardware layout, which has radios. It has multiple radios. It has multiple ASICs, uh, microprocessors, DSPs, memory. It has battery, AC-DC uh, converters. It has disks, displays. Every one of these consumes energy. But there's a wide variation between when that component is asleep and when it's active, six to ten times. And the radios are even bigger. And, and remember, everything we have now is what I call a smart radio. It's everything you've got has got multiple radios and multiple processors, and they're interacting with each other. Okay. So Rajesh Gupta, who is one of my close colleagues in computer science and very, you know, one of the leaders in the, the cyber physical uh, initiatives, has uh, given me these slides. So um, how can we lead to better energy efficiency? Well, you can first of all use, particularly in multi-core or in, in multiple processors, the one that uses the least energy to keep it more awake and then to shut down the, the bigger one when it's not needed. You can coordinate between the radios. You can use actually like you know, Wi-Fi and, and, and the cellular radios and the Zigbee and so forth, you can actually use these radios to page each other. In other words, to keep them uh, asleep. I know on this particular machine here, for instance, I can just go in and, and turn on and off all of the various radios by software, right? And I keep them off unless I'm going to use them. But that's very awkward. What you want to be able to do is do that automatically um, uh, and to do the duty cycle on the radios and then there's going to be a lot of new things that are in radio. We do a lot of uh, wireless work at our center, which I won't get into today. But there's a lot of new techniques for um, uh, if you know the range your radio has to get and, your, and the traffic that's you know, there's the other folks that are using the spectrum, you can actually do a lot of clever things to minimize um, the energy. So you know, Bluetooth, for instance, and Wi-Fi. Um, the, these are showing you just the variations between uh, when these things are dormant, 5.8 milliwatts, uh, versus 81 milliwatts when the radio is running. See, it's a huge variance, right? And the same goes here with the Wi-Fi. And then you can actually have the Bluetooth radio, which you wouldn't normally think about doing, work with the Wi-Fi uh, radio to minimize and the other thing I guess I should say is that the, the other real driver here is these miniaturization of sensors that make those sufficiently cheap that you can put sensors throughout all of this uh, device uh, to give you data that helps you do algorithms for the energy that uh, actually gets to the thermal limits of what you can do. So from an algorithmic point of view, there's sort of two things you can do. You can take advantage of the sleep states. And so you can actually just shut down components by using dynamic power management. So you have a, a what's called a power aware architecture. Or you can slow down among the multiple active states using dynamic voltage frequency scaling. And of course, as usual, you can use both of those and use them in different combinations. Well, just to show you the proof of the pudding, uh, if, if this is uh, Rajesh's uh, 
Soniloquy uh, program, and you can see it's a USB uh, device that uh, fits into uh, a standard ThinkPad like I'm using here, and it, it manages the radios and the various uh, hardware components. And here's the result in terms of the power consumption in watts. So normally, you're running about 16 watts, and your batteries will last for about four hours. Um, in low power, you know, you shut down the brightness of the screen and, and you're not using it and so forth, um, you're down to about 11 watts. If you're sleeping, you're down to three quarters of a watt and your batteries would last 88 hours. But being active, doing your normal work, what this thing plugged in, you can actually get the power down to one watt. So there's a, there's a, a greater than 10, a 15 to one reduction. Well, imagine if we went back to that curve and we had this built in, by then of course built actually into the PC itself, and we could bring that curve down by 15 times. That's the kind of, you know, uh, advantage we have in terms of reducing the, the emissions. Now, believe me, all major companies understand this and are, and are devoting more and more of their resources to becoming quote-unquote green uh, I'll show you about the Sun uh, portable data centers that we're using. Uh, Google obviously has all kinds of green initiatives. So does Microsoft, IBM, Intel. And I just picked these off the web just to sort of show you. This is a, I could have, you know, another ten slides of nothing but uh, articles on how industry is doing it. So they they've been convinced and they're driving as hard as so th they would love to have innovations from all of you. <laughs> I mean every major company is desperate for new ideas. And so this is why I'm hoping that you'll go away thinking about, in addition to the normal optimization uh, constraints you put on your software, what about energy? Now, the data centers, uh, oddly enough, have really begun to understand this. Here is the power curve in kilowatts per year uh, for US data centers. And you can see the curve we were on was just going to go up and up and up and up. but uh, this is the Environmental Protection Agency historical trends here. Um, but there's been big studies by the EPA and, and, and in this case the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, um, which has a great report on this, uh, and using best practices. So for instance, instead of cooling the whole room to take the heat away from a few processors, what if you just put the cooling on the processors? See that you use much less electricity to, to cool that way, and you get the same result. And so that's one of the big um, uh, advantages. So one way to do that is instead of having a big room, you take an international cargo container, which Sun Microsystems has done with their um, modular data centers. You can put, say, seven racks, but it's it's got uh, liquid cooling going through the racks. It has um, all kinds of sensors for um, the temperature and the electricity utilization all the way through. It has active management of the disk and CPUs, you know, putting the disk, stopping them when they're not being used, spinning them up quickly, um, and so forth. So the Na National Science Foundation uh, gave us a grant of $2 million to uh, do what we call the project, uh, the Greenlight Project. And so we've set up two of these now, um, and we are um, involved in doing a lot of tests. Now, here's the way I think about it, because I'm an application scientist originally. The data center folks are all worried about the mechanics of this stuff, and that's very good. But if you're an end user from, say, metagenomics, or you're doing some sort of calculation in, in digital media, you have an application and you want to run it remotely on this. Well, your application has multiple ways algorithmically that it can go from the statement of the problem to what you're going to actually program. So you can choose this algorithm, this algorithm, this algorithm. You can invert the matrix this way, you can invert the matrix that way. Each of those have a different energy profile and you can run those on different computer architectures. You can run it on a multi-core. You could run it on a GPU, graphics processing unit. You could run it on an FPGA. Okay, So all of these, it's like a decision tree. And all of those different choices end up with probably a different turnaround time, 
but also a different amount of energy usage and so that's what we're set up to measure and then publish in an open fashion the results on the web so we have a service oriented architecture researchers anywhere can come in and once we you know approve them as users come in and run their particular application and then say run it on a GPU instead of reprogram it so it can use the GPU instead of using the multi-core and so on and then we're developing the middleware that automates the optimal choice so you get sort of tools and then we're working also with all the minority serving institutions in the United States to try to get up a new generation of people thinking about this you can see that Intel NVIDIA, Convey, Arista and Koi and so forth they're all partners with us on this these are the two boxes and this is the inside you can pull out these things so then we got a bunch of our computer science faculty to begin to do research projects on this and using different kinds of computer architectures different kinds of software architectures this is different kinds of streaming media visualization power and thermal management user interface and so forth and I'll just show you a couple of the results virtualization is obviously a big part of it because you you want to if you you know you think of one of our campuses and we've got all of these different clusters scattered around most of them aren't being used but say 10 or 20 percent of the time and yet the electricity to keep them going and so forth and cooling is going 24 7 so if you imagine virtualizing the workload and now running it on something that's say 80 percent efficiently used then obviously you get a lot more calculation for the same amount of energy but you have to deal with fault isolation software heterogeneity um, and this is we have something called Usher that our computer scientists at, at UC San Diego have developed um, but you can look at factors of 10 reduction in machine resources and energy consumption factors of 10 and so we see corporations everywhere now moving to virtualization as the first thing they're thinking about okay well what about this dynamic power and thermal management remember we talked about some of this back on the laptop so a lot of the same principles including the machine learning algorithms and uh, other techniques can be carried over here and this is some, some work by uh, Tiana Rosing who's one of our faculty um, okay so if you take dynamic power management what you're doing is is taking machine learning using the outcome of the sensors and the performance counters and then going in and um, doing multitasking and tax uh, adaptation of the voltage and frequency and she's shown now for a particular class of workloads up to a 70 percent energy savings okay. so these are big numbers if you look at something that's a different approach dynamic thermal management I find this one particularly interesting. Imagine that you have in machine learning, you realize that you have an algorithm, say it's a graphics algorithm, and, and it's going along doing some sort of normal stuff, and then it goes into the GPUs. Now you know GPUs generate a lot of heat. So when you start using the GPU, all of a sudden the temperature goes up a lot. But if you know from machine learning of that algorithm, of that application, you're getting to a point where they're going to go into the GPU, you pre-cool. And so then when the heat starts coming up, you're immediately effectively taking, transferring the heat out. So this is dynamic thermal management. You wouldn't normally think about doing this, but this is what's going to be needed is a new way of thinking. 60% reduction with no performance hit. So what we're doing effectively, whether it's in the laptop or whether it's in the data center, we are wasting prodigious amounts of energy because we haven't bothered to intellectually engage in how we could efficiently get our calculations done because that up till now has not been a driver in our industry so there's a lot of low-hanging fruit effectively that we can go after here let me show you another one um, exploiting parallelism at the processor level so what it amounts to is as I said we have lots of coprocessors and so in particular one of the things you can do is um, 
take the compute intensive piece of the calculation and put that on a coprocessor that's optimized for that task and then keep the general work going on and the uh, say multi-core. So in a good example is we have a, um, a mass spectrometry algorithm that's used all over the country that came out of UC San Diego and uh, Convey is this new company that Steve Wallach developed that has an Intel multi-core and an FPGA but internally very tightly coupled, way more than anything that everyone's done before. Um, and, and, and so as a result, we're able to get a 300-fold speed up and essentially a 300-fold reduction in energy on this algorithm. Well, that means that first of all, uh, a lot more science is going to get done because it could done be done much more quickly, but also we're going to save a lot of energy and CO2 emission that would otherwise happen. Uh, we have a lot of vendors coming to us, like Quadrix, for instance, designing new 10 gig uh, aggregators that are much greener, 20 to 80 percent less power. And they want to demonstrate it to the world, so they come and we put it in green light and then make those uh, data available. Now that's all pretty conventional in a certain sense, but let's think about going back, really coming back and saying, okay, our computers run on DC. A large portion of the energy around the world is in these stupid bricks that we carry around that are AC to DC converters. But as we move to alternate energy sources, like solar produces DC, or fuel cells produce DC, well then why not get rid of the AC and just run the DC power source directly to the computers running DC and save all of that energy that goes into the conversion. So we've got two megawatts of solar power cells in B, uh, that are installed now at UCSD, and next year we're going to get this 2.8 megawatt fuel cell that just gets the methane that's coming out of the bacteria in the waste treatment plant down at Point Loma, um, south of the university, and then liquefy it, and we take it up, and we use that as fuel for this. So it's, it produces no carbon dioxide. In fact, it saves the methane going into the air, and that produces that. Um, and then it's 2.8 megawatts. Well, one of these black boxes is only 200 kilowatts, right? So we can run 20, <laughs> uh, 10 or 20 of these uh, sun boxes off of this one thing. So we're working with uh, Lawrence Berkeley Lab and Sun, and we're putting in a proposal right now uh, to uh, essentially uh, go DC to DC. Um, and continue on top of that all the work I just told you about of the using the sensors to shut down or sleep the computers, using virtualization and so forth. So each of these, if you like, is an experiment. It's to see could we do it. Now whether it's actually economically practical, whether companies are going to start doing this or not remains to be seen. But for us in academia, our job is to show the way, is to actually investigate the possibilities and then make that available. Perhaps the most interesting uh, idea I have is from Bill St. Arnaud from Canary. He and I will be giving a joint uh, keynote to Educause in November. But if you imagine, the main thing we've got to do is to get away from like coal plants and go to solar, biofuels, nuclear, wind, whatever that don't produce CO2 into the air. Well, what about putting the data center right there? So in other words, instead of having to lose more electricity going across the transmission lines for the electricity, why don't we just put the data center right where the source of energy is and then use fiber optics, which don't take the energy, to transmit the bits, okay? And, and so we're um, thinking about doing uh, just that. Um, Obviously, you're saving up to 15% alone just in the transmission lines. There's all kinds of games you can do with carbon offsets as the carbon trading system develops. So we're actually talking with British Columbia about putting a green light kind of facility at one of their hydro sites. And then we have very good fiber optic connections in Canada and the US. And in fact, we run them at 10 gigabits per second dedicated uh, with nobody else on them. So we can do massive data transfers and that sort of thing. 
Now, I'm not going to have time to take you into this part of the uh, equation, which is, okay, everything I've talked to you about is just taking that 2 or 3% a year that we represent as ICT and making that smaller. But by massive application of our technologies to the electric grid, making the smart grid that people are all talking about, to the smart transportation system, to smart buildings, to using virtual conferencing instead of travel and so forth, that can reduce that can reduce CO2 emissions by five times the amount of our whole sector. Okay? So this is where the big big payoff is. Uh, again, I won't take you through this, it's way too complicated, but this is showing you in terms of gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year um, uh, the amount that's used in all these areas. And you can see the big parts here are in things like smart buildings and smart electric grids. So for instance, smart electric grids would say 1.75 gigatons. Our entire ICT emission in 2020 will only be 1.4. So it would save as much as all of our emissions uh, just by, by going to smart electric grid. So the idea that I've been preaching is, look, we all live in small cities called campuses. These are wonderful test beds of the way our whole civilization could move regardless of where we are and what country we are. And so all of us in campuses should be dedicating ourselves to moving as quickly as possible with as many innovations as possible toward carbon neutral or as green as possible uh, a, a campus. That gives our politicians and everybody else who's fighting over this stuff models to learn from. So for instance, UC San Diego will be able to detach itself from the electrical power grid in another two years. We'll be internally uh, independent uh, energy-wise, and almost all of that will be at the lowest possible level of CO2 emission. So we can look at these things like smart grids, using, as I showed you, solar and fuel cells, non-greenhouse gas emitting electricity sources. Uh, we can actually do smart buildings. We're instrumenting several. Our computer science building is being instrumented uh, along with the CalIT2 building. Uh, to understand where we can go in. and uh, We have our CS building more computers than we have humans, and the computers emit more energy and take more cooling than the humans. Okay, so we can make a big impact on the energy use of that building. Why buildings? 40% worldwide of the greenhouse gas emissions are associated with buildings. Okay, so if we can make a dent in that using information technology, sensors, and uh, machine learning feedback loops and so forth, then uh, we have a huge impact. Uh, same with transportation systems. Uh, we've got a lot of work going on in that uh, using next generation telepresence. So uh, this is my last slide. What's happening is that the academic centers that are beginning to focus on this are also able to convene. We can convene meetings, in this case, uh, the. Uh, meeting that we just uh, held in January was the first time the California Public Utility Commission had actually co-hosted a conference with UC San Diego. And, and, and in that, we were able to get the top energy person from Google. We were able to get top people from uh, you know, Hewlett Packard and Intel and so forth uh, to come together and spend two days talking through these issues, understanding how the universities can be first movers, can really be the people examining the innovations that are going to be effectively transferred to the market and then applied in, in the mass. Um, and, and a lot of these conversations don't take place otherwise. These people live in separate worlds. And you can bring them together. And once you do, everybody understands they have a common cause. And they would like to work together. And so this is one of the th reasons I think the universities are so important. But as you go away from this conference and you keep thinking about the services, architectures that you're writing, the applications you're writing, the computers you're designing, think about including energy as your primary constraint. And it will give you a very different set of answers, which will be quite innovative and therefore very interesting to everybody. Thank you.
shy bunch of people. Good. Start and then you're next. Go ahead. Yes, uh, they are. And in fact, uh, the question is, did I include, uh, well, I didn't. Did the 2020 report include, yes. Um, the game consoles worldwide use as much electricity as the city of San Diego. That's a lot. Yes, sir. I, I had a comment about the, uh, you said that to cool the processor inside of the server was, it had the same effect as cooling uh, all of the heat that was generated. And actually, that's a little bit of a mistake, I think, because a processor takes maybe 100 watts, 130 watts, right. and a server is almost 1,000 watts. So if you sure. look at all the memory, the disks, the uh, Ethernet connections, it really adds up. And it's almost like your analogy about U.S. and Canada is only 14 percent of the power. Uh, right. It's the same kind of thing. Don't blame the processors. The memory is getting pretty intensive these days. No, it, no, it is. And, it, and as I say, it particularly as we go to more mobile devices, the uh, radios actually dwarf those. So, uh, but the amazing thing is that even when you take that into account, that what he's saying is that the uh, processors uh, uh, in a PC are, are much less energy intensive than servers. But in spite of that, the data centers still are only 18% uh, of the total worldwide. But you're absolutely right about that point. Appreciate that. Uh, you compared the IT industry to uh, the aviation industry. Um, what about personal transportation? If we, if we do everything right in IT, but we all continue to drive our own internal combustion uh, cars uh, to work every day, right. Well, it's certainly true at the highest level that America set a standard for the world starting after World War II in the 50s that the automobile was this wonderful uh, machine of personal freedom. And we redesigned our entire demographics uh, of our society with suburbs, first suburbs and then exuburbs. And, um, and so now we all are in this crazy situation where the most productive people in the world are spending hours a day on the freeway just emitting greenhouse gas and getting nowhere. This is completely insane. This is wrong. And so we have to rethink this from the ground up. The trouble is social transformations like that are going to take 50 years. Well, you saw where we're going to be in 50 years. We don't have 50 years. So somehow or other, we're going to have to make the changes a lot quicker. You know, the thing that drives me crazy is you see things like the G8, or even worse, our Congress debating this cap and trade thing. And you have, of course, a bunch of folks who still are denying there's such a thing as, as global change, uh, you know, who, whatever. Uh, and and then, but you, but you, it's just quibbling as if it's healthcare or anything else. Okay, this issue transcends in scale and scope any issue humans have ever dealt with at any time in history. And if you look at what this country was able to do in World War II, where we went from building a a warship in you know a year to building one a day in less than a year. Okay. That's what we need, and, and, and that sense of urgency isn't here yet. And that's why I'm including it in every talk I give, because we have got to get clear on this issue. We have very little time. Or another way of saying it is, every day that we procrastinate, the climate is going to be that much warmer for the next 1,000 years. And so how warm do you want it to get? The longer you wait, the warmer it gets. And then it'll stay that way. It's not just your problem or your children's problem or your grandchildren's problem or your great-grandchildren's problem. It's a thousand years. That's, you know, we talk about market forces. That's just great. A thousand years ago, there weren't markets. They got invented about a thousand years ago at the end of the medieval period and the start of the Renaissance. That's how far back in time you have to go to sort of get an idea. Everything we know about markets, basically, have occurred in the last, the first university and modern university was a thousand years ago. Okay? 
That's the kind of time scale we're talking about that we've committed, we, we by our actions, are committing the world to. So, you know, all of us need to be at least including this as part of what we're doing professionally and, for instance, worrying about energy as a part of our design of software and computers. Yeah, okay. Right. From, from. Right, right. And sometimes up to 400. Yeah. So the question is, is what, there's a whole engineering uh, discipline of the changing the voltages and, and so forth within the DC that I'm not an expert in but the people involved in this project are. There's also a lot of startups and a lot of uh, VC, uh, venture capitalist funded um, devices in this whole ACDC world and in the DC world that are innovations that are just coming out now and some of them aren't even out yet as companies. So it's an area of actual uh, very active research is a good point. So I would expect that the internet infrastructure itself yes. would consume a lot of power, a lot of energy. Mm -hmm. So people have been talking about this new internet, which I don't know whether this will happen or not. But do you know if they have incorporated any you know, green design ideas into whatever they are proposing? Right. Um, that's a good point. So there is a whole program in the United States, and there are in uh, Europe and, and Asia as well, to look at uh, designing um, quote unquote a next generation internet based on everything we've learned in the last uh, 30, 40 years of, of the internet um, and she's saying um, are we including for instance uh, making it a much more energy efficient um, uh, one of the my colleagues in Australia Rod Tucker at the University of Melbourne for instance uh, it publishes a lot on taking the entire structure of the internet including all the routers and um, everything and then optimizing over that entire internet. Um, uh, one thing you should all think about is, you know, there's we we tend to we tend to sort of assume layer three and networking is where we live because packet switching is so ubiquitous. But in fact, a good fraction of what goes over the internet is not TCP; it's actually UDP. And layer two and layer one, in principle, are much more energy efficient. So if you don't need to route something you can save energy. So if you think about half of the uh, traffic on the internet today is uh, video streams. Well, video streams are going from point A to point B. Why packetize <laughs> all of that information in each frame, scatter it all over the world, and reassemble it when you can just stream it from point A to point B? And, and so there's a lot of innovations in using layer one and layer two to be much more energy efficient for the internet as, a se as, it's, as itself. And then there are other protocols and, and such that people are looking at that are, uh, again, energy focused. Good point. Well, thank you very much. You want more? Yeah, okay. I, I want to let you get to your next event. When I plug in my laptop or leave my server running at home, I don't notice any difference in my electrical bill. I don't watch it very carefully. And right. probably most people are the same. Sure. So has anyone thought of some way of making more visible to the users, you know, this idea of hypermiling other people doing their right. cars or right. a little application that shows I've just, you know, how much juice have I just used, how much CO two have I just emitted? Yes. So first of all, the power companies themselves in the United States are installing uh, millions of smart meters at home. And what this will do is not only expose the um, use of each of your appliances. So there's a chip that is now an industry standard that's going into all appliances that plug into the wall. And those can be communicating the instantaneous energy usage. Um, and so as you buy new appliances, those things will be in there with the smart meters. They can talk to the smart meters and literally talk to the utilities. 
um, and uh, in fact the utilities in the fullness of time will be able to reach in and turn down your electric coffee pot for uh, 100 milliseconds uh, to essentially you know, doing that for millions of appliances in a city avoid peak loading and brownouts and, and so that's where we're going. Now making that visible to the homeowner for instance is one of the ideas but not only that but what is the current instantaneous price for the electricity? So at night, prices for electricity are sometimes as much as eight to ten times cheaper than during uh, two in the afternoon when everybody's got their air conditioner on. And, and so making it a, a market, essentially, where you not only can see what in your house is, um, or your office is, is drawing electricity, but also could you switch it to a time where it's going to use um, uh, less costly forms of electricity. For instance, in California at night, a lot of the wind power comes at night, but then there's not so much demand. But if you know that there's wind power and you can say, wash your clothes overnight or do your dishwasher overnight or things like that, you actually are transferring your demand to a non-carbon producing supply. That's where we're going. It's essentially an internet of energy and we're doing a lot of it, uh, like in our campus, we have 40 of our buildings that you can actually go to a web browser and see the instantaneous energy use of that building. And in some of our buildings, we're actually breaking it down by floor. And eventually what we want to do is make it available to, on the web to all the people in the building so they can literally change their lights, their computers, and things like this. And we've done some experiments in the student dorms where we actually can make unbelievably dramatic impacts on the energy usage. Uh, because the kids are so motivated. They love this thing. It's like a game. Uh, if we could get the kids' attitude transferred to the adults, we could probably beat this problem. But <laughs> Okay. You, you tell me. I'm, I'm, I'm good for as long as you want. <laughs> yeah, well, Sinji, where is he? Uh, is here from uh, NICT in Japan, is one of our major collaborators in Japan. Um, and he has uh, just told me that he's working on a similar project at Greenlight. Tom Defani, who works at Cal 82 as the PI of Greenlight, was in Japan recently talking to a lot of the folks there. We work closely with uh, colleagues in uh, the UK and Netherlands, uh, Czech Republic, Poland, um, Korea, Taiwan, Australia. Uh, uh, all over. Um, and there's actually getting to be a really good competition uh, among folks uh, internationally to come up with the very best ideas, but there's also a real sense of sharing uh, and collaboration that's going on as well. Um, and, and I think we're going to see more and more of that. It's quite in, that's quite encouraging. people, by everyone to produce a lot of data today. A lot of data. data. Mm -hmm. And you know, to retain all of them, <laughs> actually. Yes. You never throw away any, any piece of data. Right. So it is true that data centers will become more efficient, but we may end up with more data centers anyhow. So is there any projections on the number of data that humankind can produce, let's say, you know, in, in 10 years or 20 years? Right. There was a project at Berkeley called How Much Data, which has now been transferred to UCSD, uh, and there are a number of other projects like that that continue to um, to do this. Um, it's not just that we each are producing more data, but because of things like social networks, I think you have a panel this afternoon uh, on social networks, um, there are uh, is a lot more sharing of that data, so sharing of pictures, sharing of videos, sharing of of uh, uh, you know, instant messaging, all this. So there's a there's a great deal of horizontal amplification of the data flow as well, and then all of those flows need to be saved, right? Like our email all gets saved. And it, so it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the thing I think is, fan is is interesting. If you look at this, this is the thing that was the most eye-opening chart. That's why I've left it up. The data centers, in spite of everything the vast increase of data and everything else you're talking about, nonetheless, are 18% of the problem. Well, thank you very much for your attention.